Well, hello everyone and welcome to this Endcare Species Guide Remastered series. Now, this Remastered series of Endcare Species Guide is where I take my old videos and produce them again with either the same or more and better information if that applies and the most important thing is a better production value. Now, if you want to watch the original video on this end species that I'm doing today, I'll leave an iCard over on the top there where you can see the original video, which is a hidden video on my channel. Okay, so let's begin. So, today we're going to be talking about Paranoia pigeonitans, which is an end species that I like a lot, though they are not exactly beginner friendly. They have a few common names and all of them have a reason to be so. They are known as European honeypot ants, false honeypot ants, and winter ants. They are known as European honeypot ants because they are from Europe. They are known as false honeypot ants because they are not exactly honeypot ants like the ones that exist in America. The storage that they have is not the storage of the substance they consume. They don't consume water and store water. They don't consume insect guts and store insect guts inside their guts. They eat like any other ant, and then they create fat storages which enlarge their gasta and give them the same appearance and same function, which is a reservoir for nutrition for the other ants. So whenever an ant or larvae is in needing of feed, they can be taken to, or the food from the repletes can be distributed around the colony, working as basically walking fridges, which by the way, they don't walk a lot. They're not as prominent to be standing still as the actual honeypot ants, they can still move around and take care of root, but they do move very slowly and not very often. So most likely you'll see them being just in the same place. Most of the times if they can hang in upside down, though as I've said they don't do that 100% of the time like most honeypot ant species do. And they're also called winter ants because they have their nuptial flights at the end of winter so basically they do that while it's, developed, while it's still very cold outside. This species hails from Southeast Europe. They exist all around the Black Sea and their range extends as far west as Italy. So they are temperate species and when it comes to humidity, what they want is anything between 30% and 70%, though they will thrive better with having the, the, the humidity be above 50%. However, that is what I say for most ant species, and by that I mean that the outside should be around 50, especially a little bit, a little bit higher, and the inside of the nest should be with higher humidity than that. However, in honeypot ants, I actually suggest that if you can, you make the outer world be slightly less humid than 50, maybe say 40 something percent, and then have the outer world, the, the, the nest be above 50%. They are accustomed to having a great difference of humidity between the outside and the inside of the nest and that's because of where they live and how they build their nests, which is something that I'll talk about in the end of the video. So if you want to know about that, stick around until the end. When it comes to temperature, they really do uh, live any well in anything between 20, 18 degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Celsius. However, to have them thrive properly, I suggest having temperatures between 21 and 25 degrees Celsius. Though if you keep them with other ant species in the same ant room or something, and your ant species live better in 26, 27 degrees Celsius, which is the most common temperature for their ants to like to be at, you can keep these species at those temperatures and they'll be fine. However, if you can give them a little bit more of a cold side of the room or something, they will appreciate it a lot. Now, hibernation. They hibernate from October to February and after they, they wake up from their, from their hibernation in February, they send out their, uh, their lates to have the nuptial flight, which means that they have this, this nuptial flight in winter, as I've mentioned before. They hibernate below 15 degrees Celsius, technically, though I would say that considering where they live, and considering other species that like 15% to 16 degrees Celsius and where those species live, I would say that they're better off closer to 10 degrees Celsius than they are to clo to close to 15. Technically, below 15 they won't wake up uh, out of the blue in the middle of the winter, but I would keep them 
closer to 10 than closer to 15, just to be safe if I could, though I usually don't hibernate my ants. When it comes to sizes, this species of ant has the worker be 3 to 4 millimeters in length, and the queen is around 8, 9, 10 millimeters, she's about a centimeter long, which means she's quite big in comparison to the workers, and she is very large in in width as well. She's a lot fatter than the average worker, except the ones that are complete, of course. They are all orange-brown in color, which, you know, if you have them in a naturalistic setup, they probably won't be very, very easy to see. But they do use well any ant-keeping setup that you may give them, except that you have to keep in mind that due to their size, they are capable of squishing through some stuff. Uh, some holes in nests for ventilation or humidity, they can probably squeeze through them, so you must be sure that the holes or nets in your setup are small enough to the point where they can't get through. They, they can't squish their bodies a lot, they're, they're like the small chromatogaster species. They actually have a body plan very similar to them when not enlarged to become a replete. When it comes to the actual colony size, they can be monogenous or polygynous, but they don't really tend to have more than a, than a few queens. Usually, when you have a polygynous colony of these, you'll end up with having two or three queens, not more than that. They will end up either budding off or dying, because they're not as efficient, because they require a lot of attention and space, and they from some reason, in the wild and in captivity, they really don't do well with more than two or three queens. However, the maximum size of workforce that you'll get out of a Paranolopis nictinus colony is somewhere around the 20,000 workers, which is, in my opinion, quite impressive. It's a lot of workers, 20,000, and though they are small and they can fit in kind of small setups, even at big sizes, unfortunately, they don't really get to those sizes in captivity. In captivity, it's more likely that you get a few thousand. With very good husbandry, I can see them get to the 10,000 or above that, but expect to have only a few, like, five to 7,000 in a very big colony that has reached maximum capability under your care. One thing you should keep in mind as well is that if you have a queen, they are claustral and they are very easy to be disturbed, so you must keep them in a place that's constantly dark and without any vibrations and check on them very sporadically. One thing that you have to keep in mind is that the the egg to adult worker of the first eggs laid by the queen takes around two months to complete, which is quite a lot for such a small ant species. That is maybe a detriment, but it means that you have a time window in which you know you should not be checking on the ant, only very sporadically and very calmly, because they will abandon or eat the eggs if disturbed very easily. Also, to have better chances of actually getting a colony, you should put two queens together. They will form a colony together. If you put them together, they will collaborate. However, if you're buying them, it is quite expensive to buy two queens. So if you're buying, I suggest you buy only if you can buy a colony, which will be better bang for your buck. If you can capture them outside during national flight, then capture a few and make couples or triplets of queens and have those form colonies together. Now, don't worry, the two months time that takes from a single egg to an adult worker uh, goes down as the colony grows in size and gets more nutrition. Uh, it doesn't always work like that and they are, they are small species, which means that they are kind of fast in, in growth rate, though they are slower in growth rate than other temperate species of the same size, I, at least in my experience and in what I found online. When it comes to feeding these girls, what you want to do is give them a lot of sugary solutions. So anything sweet they'll love. Much like Campanotas, they will eat eagerly honey, sugar water, any type of sweets and fruits. They actually enjoy fruits a lot, I find. And you should not uh, forget to give them the occasional insect because they do need protein to have the larvae and eggs develop and be produced constantly. They don't take in a lot of insects, but you should provide them enough to where they are always satisfied with the amount of insects they get. They are, as I've said, 
slower than you would expect for their size and growing. So if you want to have them grow the best and the fastest, you should make sure that they have the best nutrition they can at all times. Now let's talk a little bit about behavior. Uh, they are very calm, very confident in moving around the, the, the nest and the setup, uh, especially when they get a little bit bigger. When they are smaller, they are very skittish and they will flee away into the nest if disturbed, which is something weird because most of the time what you have is the ants coming out of the, of the nest to protect it. But this, and the thing I said before, the, 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 the gradient that they want between the outside and the inside of the nest is due to the behavior they have when actually building their nests. In the wild, they'll build a main shaft down into the hole, into the ground, and have their, have their sort of ant rooms all connected to that main shaft. And the rooms only start opening up from the main shaft at like half a meter below the soil. Of course, when the colony is very small, when they're, they're, they're just starting off, this is not what happens. They nest closer to the, the surface. But in the setup, they can't really tell how deep or how far or whether or not they are or not away from the surface because they, they get all jumbled up. Usually we don't have even the nest below the outworld, but they, they'll do fine, don't worry. They'll be just fine and they'll thrive all the same. But there are these, these behaviors that come from that natural behavior of nest building in the wild. So uh, that's all I think you need to know about these ant species. I know they're not exactly for beginners, but if you're looking into getting like your fifth, sixth ant species and you want to get them, I say you should go ahead if you can and they'll be amazing pets and I hope this guide helps you to figure out exactly what you need to know to take good care of them. Ay, 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 ay.